So we're going to do a basic knee demonstration um, using the Philips IU22 system. I have a linear 12 transducer, which is um, the best for knee examinations. I'm going to start in the suprapatella area. You can see here the quadriceps tendon is attaching onto the patella to its superior portion. And we can scan through medially to laterally, making sure we cover the entire tendon. It is quite a thick tendon, quite a wide tendon side to side. So like all ultrasound, you need to make sure you cover the entire area and sweep back and forth. You'll see below in the suprapatellar fossa, there's a small amount of fluid here, and that's quite normal. Um, most people have a little bit of fluid. Um, when it gets an excessive amount, say we're sort of starting to get to this level, um, that would be called a suprapatellar effusion. And that's certainly something that ultrasound can guide a needle to drain. If we go down to a transverse section now, watching the quadriceps tendon here, as I said, it's quite a wide tendon side to side. So that's why the linear 12 is a good choice because it's got such a wide face. You can see here, this is the tendon in its entirety. Looks nice and homogenous. It's quite an echogenic tendon. As we scan down towards the patella, again, you come into this small amount of fluid here. Again, quite normal, so nothing to worry about. <laughs> and we scan all the way down until its insertion on the patella. Again, you have to be a little careful with um, an isotrophy here and make sure that you um, heel toe the probe effectively because if we heel more than a few degrees away from perpendicular, you can see how hypoechoic this tendon becomes. Um, and that's indicative of tendon tearing or tendon inflammation, tendinosis. So you don't want to um, create a false positive there. So just make sure that you keep 100% perpendicular to the tendon. You can see that the fibers fill in here and it becomes nice and echogenic and that's exactly what you're looking for. Underneath you'll see a small amount of cartilage. Again, this is quite normal. Um, try not to mistake this for fluid. And again, just tracking it all the way down onto that superior portion of the patella. We're going now to the pre-patella area of the knee. There is a bursa that lives in this spot. Patients will invariably present with inflammation or a bump on top of their knee. You need to use a fair amount of gel for the pre-patella portion. Um, you can see here I've got a little bit of a standoff created by the thick gel because the pre-patella bursa, it sits in this subcutaneous region above the patella tendon or the patella ligament. Um, and if you push too hard, you can completely compress it. So you can just imagine if there was a, a line of fluid just sitting above the patella tendon here, above the mid portion of the patella, that's where you're gonna find the bursa. And again, it, it is indistinguishable unless you have fluid in there. But again, make sure that you're um, not pressing too hard and obliterating the, um, the bursa completely. So on we go to the infrapatella portion of the knee. So infra obviously meaning below, so be below the patella here. This is the superior portion of the patella tendon. Again, you see it's a nice homogenous tendon. Again, some people call it the patella ligament. Either is, either is perfectly fine. Um, the fibula pattern of the tendon is nice and smooth and even. There's no interruption to the patent, the linear echogenic pattern here. Below, there's a thing called fat pad. Again, quite normal for it to be hypoechoic soft tissue down here. And again, just sweep side to side, make sure you're covering the entire tendon from medial to lateral. Again, with the 12 megahertz transducer, we can almost get the entire length of the tendon. It's quite a long tendon and it's distal attachment here. You can see it fans out as it attaches distally. So again, really important to make sure you scan medially to laterally. And make sure you cover that entire distal attachment portion. So on we go laterally now. At the level of the knee joint itself. You see proximal up this way distal down this way, proximal tibia. In the middle, just here, again being very wary of an isotropy, 
you'll see an echogenic triangle just here, if we can make that out. And that's the lateral meniscus, that's the padding of the joint laterally. It's quite a common place, particularly in athletes, to get tearing along there. We can really zoom up on that meniscus here, covering this entire portion here. Again, you can approach this from posterolaterally. laterally. Um, some people have quite a bit of success with that approach. I find that the straight lateral approach is quite effective also. The other trick you can use for looking at um, menisci in the knee is the chroma mat. The eye is a little more um, sensitive to shades of colour than it is to shades of black and white. And so small little ten, uh, meniscal tears that come through here, which are going to appear as hypoechoic fissures in this echogenic structure, um, sometimes they show up a lot clearer using the chroma. So that's just a little trick to keep in mind. So again, having a look now further afield and assessing the entire lateral knee complex, again using the entire range of the transducer, um, five centimetres I believe it is. Lying above the lateral meniscus, you see the lateral collateral ligament sits just above. Again, you're assessing that for integrity, making sure it's intact. Above that, you're seeing the iliotibial band. Again, this is a really long structure that attaches distally here at the knee joint, but extends all the way up and attaches onto the hip, in fact. So whenever you're assessing the iliotibial band, um, be really um, cognizant of patient history and make sure that you um, ascertain from the patient whether it's a distal iliotibial band problem or a more proximal iliotibial band issue right up by the hip. So make sure that you get as much information out of our patients as we possibly can. You can see popliteus tendon down here. Again, it's quite round, quite um, echogenic, quite normal looking in this model, which is lovely. And again, I'm just assessing generally for fluid extending out of that joint. All right. So on we go medially. covering you in goo, I'm sorry. <laughs> Typical sonographer. So again, looks similar to the lateral side. Um, the medial meniscus can appear a little um, wider top to bottom. Um, that's normal, it's not a sign of um, widening of the joint at all. That's just the normal anatomical um, structure. Again, quite an echogenic medial meniscus now. Again, you're looking for continuity you're looking for any sort of fissuring going down through here um, or any sort of bulging is the other thing you can get from the meniscus. Sometimes the meniscus will want to come right up and above the bony structures of the knee abutting the sub-Q fascia here um, and that's something that's um, considered abnormal. Again, be sure to really zoom in on the meniscus as much as you need to. Using the HD zoom um, is ideal and again, be aware that the chroma is something that may, that may help you in your assessment of the meniscus. And again, you can look from posteromedially at the meniscus if there's a particular area, particularly deep down, sort of deep to bone here, um, if that's sort of a structure that's um, something that's of particular interest clinically, then certainly you can roll the patient slightly onto their side and um, approach from more posteriorly. But again, I find this medial approach is, is quite effective in most patients. Again, a little easier to see, I think, um, on the medial side than on the lateral side, is the medial collateral ligament. You can see again, let me just make that a little bigger. Okay, bring my, be a good sonographer and bring my focus up to where it needs to be. Okay. So you can see here a number of um, linear fibres running across here, again attaching more proximally, that's the medial collateral ligament. It's the paired structure again with the lateral collateral ligament on the other side, but again it should appear nice and thin, nice and taut, 
Again, you'll notice the knee is slightly flexed for this um, procedure. So that's certainly something to be aware of. They're the major components that we look for in the knee anteriorly. Um, the other thing that we can do, um, depending on patient's symptoms and indications, is to look posteriorly in the knee. Um, most people, when they talk about musculoskeletal ultrasound, one of the first things that comes to mind is um, a Baker cyst. And certainly that's something we're going to find posteriorly, posteriorly in the knee um, in the popliteal fossa. So um, if I could just ask you to roll up onto your side slightly facing that way. Perfect. So again, if the patient's um, difficult to, to move around, it's perfectly fine to attack this from the side. Um, again, you're going to get a better overview if you can get the patient prone. So that's just something to be aware of. So posteriorly now. Again, tibia, fibula, deep, the deep structures that you see. You can see the popliteal artery pulsing away. Again, just as a sort of corollary to your study, it's a good idea just to scan through that small portion of the popliteal artery. Again, you can assess using colour Doppler, power Doppler also, if that's something that you prefer. You can see the artery pulsing and the vein next door. So just extending your study a little bit further, giving the um, radiologists a little bit more information, you can assess the popliteal artery certainly for aneurysm, um, certainly for any um, plaque, and again the vein, certainly looking for any thrombosis um, and making sure obviously that the vein is easily compressible as part of your deep venous thrombosis study that most people would be, most sonographers would be familiar with. So again, a Baker cyst is going to appear medially in the popliteal fossa. It's going to lie between the semimembranosus and the medial gastroc muscles at the back here. So between these two guys. Um, our patient here doesn't have a Baker cyst, which is a good thing, but um, you can see it would rise from this portion of the popliteal fossa and surround the medial gastroc muscle distally. And again, more distally, you can extend your study if the patient certainly has pain that extends down in this area, down into the um, proximal calf region. You can see here this is where the short saphenous vein will sit. Again, you can extend your study to be looking for thrombosis in that. Um, medially, we have the medial gastroc muscle, this big powerful calf muscle at the back. It has a paired structure on the other side. Again, it should appear about symmetrical. This is the lateral gastrocnemius muscle and then the soleus underneath. So that's a trio of muscles at the back there, just to be familiar with. Again, just scanning through, making sure everything looks homogenous. Um, the veins contained within the muscle that you can see compressing there are easily compressible. That's another cause of calf pain is uh, thrombosis in the muscular veins, not necessarily the deep veins. So it's important to, um, to cover that also. But again, you can see how lovely and homogenous these muscles are. There's no um, areas of increased signal, uh, no areas of edema that that would indicate. Um, or the other way, um, when a muscle starts to atrophy and lose, lose its bulk, something to be aware of. And that's our basic knee exam.